Welcome back to Soulback. This is the R&B Podcast. Kyle here. I have Ed with me. What is going on, Ed? What's up, player? I am back. It is finally feeling like fall down here in the South, and it's about time. So I'm tired of sweating through my drawers every time I step out of the house. So, good times. Now, Ed, I know the summer is almost over. I guess it is over now, technically. But, man, there's so much heat that's coming out. Uh, ja Rule is set to to release a visual for every single one of his album records. Are you excited about that? Did you just compare Ja Rule old songs to heat? Did you just really do this on this podcast? <laughs> I did. Jeez, oh, let me call Montrez because I think we have a new opening for new hosts. Anyway, uh, y'all really think that this man... This man couldn't schedule one festival, but he's going to go back and re-release videos for like three or four hundred songs from 20 years ago. Play a chill. Well, if you think about it, what would it be like if Keith Sweat released a video for every single one of his songs? Would he just be bumping and grinding everywhere? No, it would actually be a pretty monumentous moment in the history of R&B if you want to take it there. How dare you could pay a King Keith to court Jester Jaw. But the thing <laughs> is, I think my man Keith's got a much tighter discard. And and I know I, we give Jaw a lot of crap because it's fun and because it's you. But honestly, I, and I've said before, early Jaw Rule is great. Jaw Rule after the 50 Cent drama when he stopped being a caricature and got serious again is actually pretty good. It's just your Ja Rule that I don't like. I'm talking about the J-Lo Ashanti era Ja Rule. The sugary, saccharine, laffy taffy Ja Rule that annoys me. Well, he's the reason why rappers sing today, so take it as it is, Ed. Oh my gosh. Four minutes. (laughs) How many minutes are we in this? Three or four minutes and I'm already heated? Yep. Well, Ed, as I'm thinking about it, what would a music video look like for Keith Sweat's record, Eeny Meeny Miney Mo? <laughs> oh would God. it be in the trap you, house? <laughs> ugh, it would be in the trap house, but everyone would be puppets. They would turn everyone into like little Jim Henson puppets, and then they would all be like singing Eeny Meeny Miney Mo. Because when I think of that song, I think of preschool. Ah, oh, jeez. Well, Ed, I know you're also teaching young students, mentoring them. Um, are you going to mm-hmm. put them onto the new Kanye West record that that sampled or covered So Anxious but with a gospel twist to it? Oh my god. I'm glad you brought this up so I can go on record with this and break some hearts. Y'all know what to do. If you're mad, run over to Twitter. Go to E.T. Bowser. I won't block you but I probably will ignore you. <sighs> the thing that I don't like about this Kanye is going gospel and everybody's going nuts thing Well, there are two reasons why I'm upset. First of all, we're acting like this is some new phenomenon. Like, Kurt Franklin hasn't been remixing R&B and hip-hop into gospel since 1992. This ain't new, people. Just because Kanye started doing it while wearing holy clothes, and I mean literally holes in his clothes, not holy ghost clothes. We'll get back to that later on with M. Bison. But now we're at this point where Kanye is reinventing himself with gospel. Isn't it ironic that, and I know people will say, oh, well, he had Jesus Walks. Yeah, I know he had that one song a long time ago. But it's always interesting to me that whenever our greats fall from grace, they go run into the church house. Because we remember before, right after R. Kelly got caught peeing on people, all of a sudden this Happy People You Saved Me album. As much as I love Whitney, she got a little harder too when stuff started getting funny with her career we see this every time i am not one to judge somebody by their spiritual walk you do whatever you want to praise jesus cool but i'm looking sideways if you all of a sudden loving the lord when people are throwing dirt on your name so you can get back in their good graces i ain't too keen on this new kanye record even though it does relive some of the r&b songs that we love here on the podcast well, Ed, you're just mad that Kanye didn't think of this idea and I thought of it first. It's going to go something like, who loves you more than Jesus? Nobody. Oh. Man, we should put that out. We should put no. that out, Ed. 
No, we cannot put that out. I refuse. I refuse. I guarantee you there is some choir director, youth director somewhere that has already beat us to that. Did I tell you about the time that one of the, I attended the church and they remixed an R. Kelly song? Like it had, I can't remember the song. Yes, they were singing a song, but they were using R. It was I Can't Sleep. That's what it was. They were using wow. I Can't Sleep's beat. And I'm saying, I'm like, that's the man that pees on people. We peeing for Jesus? Wow. <laughs> well, on a more positive note, Montel Jordan, who wrote the record Incomplete by Cisco, he actually performs that at, at his church, but he, he makes it about God. So that's kind of cool. Well, and it goes back to my point. Like, this isn't new. People have been turning gospel into, well, R&B into gospel for decades. All you got to do is take out Baby and throw in Jesus, and it's suddenly a gospel song. Well, Ed, your homework for the day, since we were on the topic of Megan the Stallion last week with the Hot Girl Summer, you got to remix that song to make it a gospel song. That's your homework for oh. the week. Oh my good. Holy girl summer? No, we done. <laughs> Summer's right. over. Summer is officially over. Alright. Well, Ed, speaking of nice hats and, and Street Fighter, uh, our girl M. Bison Fantasia released a new record. <laughs> <laughs> the Holy Ghost. Ed, I clicked play on this song and I heard like trap drums going in. I heard like a future sound of like chanting in the back. And then Fantasia caught the Holy Ghost and she was singing it. Oh my god. This is the most uh, Holy Ghost field podcast we have ever had in the history of Soul Back. <laughs> because we are just all about the Lord this fine morning. This song, I had no idea what to expect of this song. You told, I saw the song a couple days ago as of this recording. I saw it a couple days ago. I hadn't hit play. But you told me and Tom about it. And Tom was like, what? What could this song be? And then you described it. So I went and listened to it. And man, it reminds me of, for those gospel fans out there, and I remember I wrote about this, and it was for the longest time the most read post I ever had. When one of the members of Mary Mary, I think it was Erica, wrote a, um, had the song called I Love God, L-U-H. And she labeled it as Trap Gospel. And it was this big fervor. And I wrote about how trap gospel is kind of stupid. Not because of the sound, but because you know what trap really means, right? It's like drug ties. It's kind of weird to tie that to Jesus. But anyway, I wrote about it and everybody got mad and it was this big deal. Anyway, that song reminded me of that. Because she's talking about how, oh, the whenever she sings, she's filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's great and cool. But it's all these trap drums and stuff layered over it. So it's a really weird contrast, but I will say this. I can see this thing blowing up in the, in the youth choirs because this gives them a chance to milly rock to some Jesus. Yep. Well, I think it's interesting, Ed, um, when we talk about Fantasia, she was on The Breakfast Club last week, and she said something that really, really pissed me off, Ed. She oh, no, pretty what? much threw away her last album and said it was trash. And said her and the label both knew it was trash. That's why they, they didn't promote it. And the real fans would have known. Ed, why put something out if it's trash? Why waste everyone's time and money? Well, here's the thing, player. We see this a lot. Lupe Fiasco in the hip-hop world is notorious for this junk. When I wonder if his album flounder, flounders, he goes back and says, Oh, it was trash because the label didn't let me do what I wanted to do. That's why it didn't blow up. It didn't blow up because it just wasn't good, player. And in Fantasia's case, and I get what you're saying, because I'm sure when we can go back and do our research and somebody can probably do this and find out when that album dropped about how she was so excited for this album and this album was going to be a game changer and it was going to be so great and it was her best work ever. Because that's what artists always say every time they drop an album, because they want you to buy it. Even if they believe in the heart, in their heart that it's some old BS trash, they're going to hype it up because their livelihood depends on it. Now, after it's gone and done what it's going to do, then you can go back and be honest. Or in Lupe's case, and maybe even her case, make excuses for it not succeeding. But I don't think it does anybody any service to say that something I did was trash. Because what does that say about your level of commitment? 
I know that they're always extenuating circumstances to these projects. We a lot of times think that our favorite art, our artists go into the booth, sing their heart out, put all this work in, but sometimes a lot of label politics and the songs they want to come out never come out. And then you come out with something that doesn't even sound like you. Shout out to Tanache, she know about that. But when you have this opportunity to kind of rebrand yourself with a new album and then go back and trash your old works, uh, you're looking kind of funny in the light to me. I don't, it just doesn't feel professional. Even if it's honest, it doesn't feel right. Shout out to Brandy Norwood for doing that for like the last four albums. Oh, no. <laughs> Boy, your RIP to your mentions. You just messed up. <laughs> I'm not lying, but uh, yeah. So hey, I didn't say you were lying. <laughs> well, I'm reading Fantasia's uh, album on Wikipedia, the definition of, and it, and she writes in there, or not in Wikipedia, but she was quoted by saying that, uh, you know, she wished she had taken control of her, you know, artist creativity and direction earlier, um, because you know this album she had full control over. So Ed, if you had full control over it, I got to put you 100% accountable for it too. Exactly. Exactly. I'm with you on this player. And that's why I don't buy all of this. Oh, it was trash. And it was, well, I mean, I haven't listened to that album since I reviewed it. And I remember thinking it was okay. I didn't think it was trash. But for her to come out and say it, it just makes me question your commitment. I know we go through hard times. I didn't see the interview. Maybe she went into detail about why she disliked it. And maybe hearing that, I'll be like, okay, I get what you're saying. But I just don't think that it does anybody any favors to say, hey, that remember that thing I told you to buy? Oh, it was garbage. Why would I want to buy your M. Bison album? Yep. Well, Ed, this is something that the fans brought up. And this might be the case with Fantasia, along with a lot of artists. Once they see the sales for that album and it's not very good, they want to distance themselves away from it. I think you want or something. So, I mean, it's not ideal. You should be proud of all your work. But, hey, we'll see what happens with this new album, Sketchbook, with the M. Bison hat. If it does well, she might claim it as the next thriller. If it doesn't, well, I guess she's 0 for 2 for the last two albums. And if she comes back with this next album and says, oh, you know that album I put out, it was trash. Y'all were dumb to buy it. Because see, to me, that's what the narrative is. The narrative is that thing I told y'all to buy was terrible. Now, go buy this one. Well, how you last time you told me it was heat. So, is it really heat? I just think it's a mixed message. And even though it may be honest, I don't think it sends the right message. You lose the confidence of your audience when you're telling them that thing that I told you to support really wasn't good. But this one's good, trust me. And then two months later, she could be saying the same thing. And quite honestly, I know she has really hyped this album, and I like enough. I like that single. The other singles have not really moved me. So, is it really good, or is she going to be making excuses the next time? Wait, you're telling me that T-Pain song isn't moving you? Oh, that thing moved me to the toilet. That's about it. (laughs) Oh, man. And, uh, you know, one of the... And and we can move away from this shortly, but one of the comments that the fans wrote on Twitter was, you know, their their reasoning was that artists, you know, they they flip-flop a lot just because they're creatives and they might feel something one day and then the next moment they're not feeling it anymore. I guess I get that, but... And and we'll talk about Tank later, but... I feel like you should know quality from trash. It has nothing to do with creativity. There's there, there's always going to be quality no matter what you do with the record, whether it's an EDM record, a hip-hop record, an R&B record, and then there's trash in all of those genres. So an artist should always aim for quality from that standpoint. Yeah, and I get the, and I mean, that's a great point that someone made about creators and the way they think, because I guess technically I'm a creative in my, um, my chosen line of work. But I don't know. It's there's a difference between saying, hey, that space that I was in, I was in a weird space and it didn't really work out right. And saying, oh, that was that thing that I served you was trash. 
if you said that was a point in my life where things weren't really, you know, I was struggling, didn't quite work out. This time I want to do a little better. That album could have been improved by X, Y, Z. I think I would be able to accept it better. But to just say, hey, I peddled trash to you and you were dumb enough to buy it is just a bit insulting. Again, I didn't see the interview. Maybe it wasn't as harsh as I'm making it sound. But from the way you describe it, it sounds like some old bull to me. And why would I want to buy a new album, especially if you got T-Pain on it? Well, Ed, remember back in the day when you would buy like a box of cereal when it would come with a game inside? Yes. What happened to those days? Do they put the toys in the cereal anymore? I don't think they do. Well, well Ed, I read a, a report. The millennials don't even buy cereal anymore because it's too much work. So there's that. What do they eat? Their iPhones? Like you just going to swallow tweets? Like what you eat for breakfast, play? I don't understand. I'm too uh, old. I don't. They... <laughs> I'm so old. I don't know what people eat for breakfast. Uh, it appears they eat avocado. Ugh. Yeah, that's true. They they love their toast. Yep. There you go. <laughs> uh, but Gross. I was gonna say, can you imagine buying Fantasia's new album and it comes with a, a hat inside that you could wear? <laughs> oh my god. That's if a good promo item. The... <laughs> I, if it comes with a hat inside, I think for Halloween I have to be a bison this year. I kind of want this to happen now. Van Tatasia, send me a hat, and I promise you I can find a red suit, and I will be in Bison. I promise you I'll make this happen. Right. Oh. And new record out, Alicia Keys and Miguel. I think this is off Alicia Keys' upcoming album. And you know what? I got to say, I like this record, Ed, but something's wrong with Alicia Keys' voice. I can't, I can't make sense <laughs> of what it is. Something's you off about it. You can't make sense of what it is. I... Here's the thing about Alicia, and I know we have celebrated her as one of the biggest stars of the 2000s for R&B. When, you know, you both you and I are kind of in the next few weeks, we've been looking at some of the best songs that come out in the 2010s. Probably Alicia might not be on that list, spoiler alert. But um, when it comes to the 2000s, she was one of the most prominent voices. But at the end of the decade, and especially going into this decade... Yeah, her and her voice was never that strong. It was good, but it wasn't powerful or anything. But yeah, something's going on. And this song that you referenced, I liked it. There's something keeping it from loving it. Like there, I feel like there's something. If this goes on the album, this is something I feel like that I hoped it could be tinkered with a little bit because it's a solid song that I feel like should be a great song. And I don't know what it is. And it might be her voice. It might just be her performance. Something's holding it back from greatness. But it's almost great. Miguel sounds great on it. But something's off about Alicia on it. I, I do enjoy the song. And I do recommend that all our listeners go check it out. It's one of the better Alicia songs I've heard in a good while. But yeah, player, something's off. And what's up with everybody wanting to have... What did they call the video? Like a... A visual experience or something? Ah, yes. It yeah, has some weird think, name. Um, I don't know, but I think Janae started all of it with her uh, her cult anthem. Oh, no. No, we're not going to go back to the brainwashing cult song. But, <laughs> yeah, the Alicia song, it's called like a... I don't know. It's I'm going to try to look it up real quick. Because it's called uh, a visual sonic installation. Play, okay. it's called a music video from where I'm from. It's just <laughs> Michael B. Jordan, like, ballet dancing with somebody. It's called a music video. Not visual sonic brainwash. Yeah. What happened to the good old days of, like, real music videos, Ed? I where artists them. would just I... be singing in the rain? Yes, I want to see some... I want to see four brothers... Singing in the rain in their full suits. That's what I want to see. I want to see a person with all their clothes on sitting in a bathtub with no water. I want to see somebody standing in front of a parked car with their hands in their pocket looking up to oh, some yes. street lights. I yep. want to see some straight up R&B videos. I want to see some girl rolling around on her bed. Just in her bedroom. Just rolling on the bed. That is what I'm missing. Everything now is this weird, we're going to have a visual experience. Player, give me some, give me an experience of some hot music 
And I just want to see some brothers stand on the corner. I want to see some girls with some knee pads doing some weird dancing in the middle of the street in some sneakers. I want to see some videos, not whatever this is. Or, Ed, one of my favorites, this is the 2000s era when a guy would be talking to a chick. And while he's talking to the chick, he's moonwalking, he's spinning, he's windmilling, he's doing everything. Yeah, so while the chick is like, so he's walking beside the chick, and she's just regular walking, but the dude is like doing all these pirouettes around him, like doing every dance move he can think of, and the girl <laughs> is just regular walking. Ah, uh, why don't we have creativity anymore? Well, yeah, I don't know, Ed, but um, we're going to talk more about your uh, end of the decade list later on. Um, you know, once it's published, but I would say Alicia Keys' record uh, in common. I don't know if it's gonna make the list, but I felt like that was a good record for her. It didn't connect for some reason. Mm, it was okay. It was one of those songs that, in the moment, I think was good. I wouldn't. I mean, we'll see once we start putting the list together whether it does stand out. The only song to me that I thought that crossed my mind would be that song she had with Maxwell, "Fire We Make." I thought that was pretty okay. But she hasn't had, for a woman who just dominated the previous decade, she's just had a smattering of okay songs in the past 10 years. And I know it's because she's been busy, she's a wife now, she's got this blended family. Oh, that, that blended family song, that song's okay too. But she's had some okay stuff here and there, but she hasn't made her mark at all, which is weird because the R&B genre has been wide open, especially for the past five or six years. She could have easily come in and dominated, but nope. Yeah, because in the 2000s, I would say her and Beyonce were like neck and neck. Oh, they were, and they both had their yeah. roles. You had Beyonce doing kind of the pop slash um, R&B stuff, and then Alicia had the straight up soul, more traditional R&B role. Now yeah, it's just it's Beyonce just rapping and nobody doing nothing. Yeah, it's just funny to see how Beyonce has eclipsed over her and Usher when in the 2000s, I would argue Usher was probably the biggest one of those three. Oh, no question. No question. I mean, but also it's kind of hard to compare Beyonce to anybody at this point because she has eclipsed the universe. But to your point, yeah, I would put both of those over her for the 2000s. Easily. Well, Ed, that's what happens when you put out records like No Limit. You start falling a little bit. No, you. when you put out an EP <laughs> called A, and Kyle's still trying to tell me, it got a couple songs on it. Where? Not my version. You got a couple of bangers, Ed? Uh-huh. That, that gift shop song? <laughs> Gunner? <laughs> oh, no. Play, I don't I, even know hands, that song. I just know the title. You were going to get hands next time I see you for saying that. That Not birthday right. song? My God. Uh, we don't need to go there again, Ed. But what I would like to do... Is let's talk about Escape. I'm always here for Escape. Uh, our girl Latasha Scott dropped a new record, and you said it sounds like a Lizzo record. Yeah, it sounds. It's very hip hop inspired. Almost a little. Um, I, her delivery is almost a little rapish. Not she's not straight up rapping like rapping Beyonce, but she does her delivery is quite hip hop influenced. Beat is very hip hopish. The first thing I heard when I heard it, it sounded like a Lizzo record. But I'm a huge Latasha fan. I feel like she is one of the most underrated vocalists of her generation. No question. And in the late 2000s, when it seemed, well, late, I guess it was early 2000s, when it seemed like we were going to get that solo project, I was so excited. Because a lot of fans, a lot of Drew Hill fans, I remember being very excited. When it seemed like we were going to get that solo jazz project. The solo Latasha, they were talking about that around the same time. It's kind of like early 2000, 2001, around that era. And I was like, man, this is her time to shine. She's going to blow. It's going to be great. We never got it. So when I saw this record, I'm like, okay. And it's not bad. It's okay. But it's certainly not the Latasha that we came up on. And I'm not mad at growth. I'm not mad at experimentation. The song is okay for what it is, but... To me, it just sounded a little bit Lizzo-ish and not Escape-ish, so to speak. Well, you might be excited to know. I read somewhere that Escape might be coming back, you know, in its entirety with Candy involved. I know they hit the road and they do shows together, but I think Candy has signed on to work on a new album with the group. How do you feel about that? Do you think a new Escape album is, 
is needed because I don't remember. I don't remember their EP being very good. It was okay. It had there was one or two songs I really liked, but it wasn't very memorable in the long run. The problem with Escape is. I think fans want all four, and for whatever reason, Candy got a million things going on, and she's never seemed to be bothered. She is start and stop on this thing. So, no offense to Candy, but either get on board or go away, because I think fans want the full group. They want all four members. So, if you're going to ride, let's ride. If you're not, let's, let's not do it. But these starts and stops, I think, really hurt them, because when they reunited and the EP was coming out, and it was like, okay, it's going to happen... Then there was the weird thing was like Escape 3 with the 3 in the middle of the name and it just got goofy again. I want to see the group together because as we discussed on this podcast, I feel like they're one of those groups that left with a lot of gas left in the tank. They never fell off. They were never one of these groups that went on way too long and was putting out garbage. Every album they dropped went platinum. Everything they did was a success and then boom, they vanished. They left kind of unfinished business so i would love to see them come back as we just discussed there is definitely a role it's not like the marketplace is crowded and we know how well nostalgia does in 2019 if they're gonna do it do it but i want all four 100 percent agree ed now i just remembered an album that came out that definitely no one knew about um remember shy's last album we were trying to figure oh, out who my- was shy <laughs> I don't know if uh, our listeners will remember the story behind this, but Shy released an album, I think it was last year. None of us. Now, the three of us on this podcast, shout out to Tom, the three of us on this podcast, in the world of R&B, there is nothing that goes by that misses all three of us. Like, one of the three will know something. This album came and was out months, and no, we none of us knew about it. And I think... Was it was it my girl CC? I feel like one of the listeners or someone just brought it up, and we went and researched, and yes, there was this album that was out, and we not knew nothing about it. So yes, the mysterious shy album will always be hilarious to me. Yeah, so that's my thought to all of this with Escape is if they don't promote it correctly, which I'm sure they will because they have some pretty high profile members in the group. If they don't put in the work and i think i'm speaking for all groups here if you guys don't put in the work to actually promote it it's gonna end up like shy's album well it's one thing that has frustrated me greatly about r&b in 2019 i understand we don't have the platforms we don't have the tv shows we don't have the couch to sit on we don't have the ways and we talked about this a little bit with bridget keller we don't have the ways to promote music in the old way but You have to leverage the platforms you have, and you have to do it well. You can't just put out a tweet, hey, y'all, I can drop my album tomorrow. Hey, y'all, my album out. Like, that's not going to reach anybody but your super duper 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 hardcore fans that's following you every day. I follow a lot of artists, but it's not like Joe's tweets show up in my timeline 24-7. So if he randomly tweeted something, I'm not going to see it. What these artists need to do is leverage what they have. Artists like Escape, a Candy and a Tiny, especially, who have major followings. You need to be out there on your little rag. There's reality shows promoting these things. You need to be on your Instagram lives. You need to be getting your artist friends sharing and talking about it. Look how her blew up. It was because the Alicia Keys and the Tyrese's, and they were sharing, hey, y'all, there's this mysterious girl that's got this album out and it's great. You need to check it out. And before you knew it, it was number one on iTunes. And we know the story that Gabby slash her has been on in the past few years because she did a great job of promoting it in many different ways. You can't just be like, oh, escape back. Here's a song. It's not going to resonate. You got to put in some work. And we don't get the work that we used to. If major R&B outlets don't know your album out and you are a legacy artist, that ain't on us. Y'all messed up. Well, Ed, I'm going to do some homework of my own. The next week, uh, when we have a podcast again, one of those new shy songs will be our soul backtrack of the day, and no one will know what's going on. <laughs> I listened to that album, and I promise you, I can't remember a thing. And my wife loves some shy. 
that dude, I forget his name, Garfield or whatever, whoever the main guy yep. is. Oh, Lord. Ladies love that brother back in the day. <laughs> yep. Um, so, Ed, recently, um, Tank, I interviewed our boy Tank, and he mm-hmm. made an interesting point that uh, it's not that we didn't think about it, but when you put it in that perspective, maybe we're a little more forgiving. He essentially compared the music industry to sports and how, you know, in basketball, it went from being a big man game to being a three point game. And in order for players to survive, they had to change and adapt to today's uh, environment on the basketball court. And that's what he's doing with the music. You know, R&B doesn't necessarily have bridges anymore. It might be a little more hip hop sounding. So uh, in efforts to not go extinct, Tank has decided that he needs to evolve as well, which you can't be mad at him for. And I think Tank made a point that I really took to heart, which was he knows what he's doing uh, in, in this sense, and he's willing to face the consequences if it doesn't work out. But I don't know, Ed. I think he's just too talented to be making this trap stuff. Uh, here's the thing. I agree with him in theory. He's right. This is an evolving game. I get frustrated with a lot of fans. I mean, I go back and forth with Tom about this all the time, where we talk about, oh, an artist needs to do what they did to be popular. But that doesn't work when we're in a different marketplace. 2019 is way different than 2000. Let's remember what 2009 sounded like. That was 10 years ago. Now imagine what 1999 sounded like and 1989. You got an artist like Keith Sweat who's like knocked down all those genres. I mean, all those decades. He was around 89, 99, 2009, 2019. For better or worse, his music has changed. I mean, we can ignore any, meaning mighty, mo. So, like, you <laughs> have to evolve in some way. So, that's something that, yes, evolution is important because as the audience changes over, you want to stay relevant. Plus, you don't want to be putting out the same album for 20 years straight. Because that you sound dated. So you have to evolve. My issue with Tank isn't with the evolution per se. It is there is a laziness in the evolution. So, yes, trap is the sound. That's the sound that younger artists are using. If you use that blueprint to create new music that sounds different but true to your sound, you're going to appeal to both your core audience and new audience. If you just put on the trap clothes and just look like you're an imposter, you're going to only look like you're trying to appeal to one audience and alienate the others. Now, there'll be some that enjoy both because I can't stand when we my wife likes when we but she don't like his other stuff. She just likes when we. So, yes, it appeals to some fans. And obviously when we were successful, but was the album that successful? Was the follow-up that successful? Or was that just one hot song for the moment? That is what I'm talking about. So evolution is something that's important, but it has to be natural and it can't be jarring. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo for my man Keith sounded stupid because it sounded like he was trying to be Bryson Tiller or somebody. However, there are lots of artists right now who are kind of, and you know, we kind of make fun at like the alt R&B and when people try to use stupid names for stuff because it's dumb. But there are plenty of artists out there who are combining more trappish, more electronic sounds with straight up soul and making something that sounds a little different. Miguel, we talked about Miguel a little bit earlier. All of his albums sound completely different. Some sound a little rockish, some sound a little soulless, some sound a little Latin. But it's a constant evolution and I respect that. As opposed to being like, okay, I'm doing what all the little kids are doing. Look at me, the old man in the club being cool. You will be entertaining for a flash in the pan and it's not going to last. Well, one of the points that I um, I realized is that over the course of Tank's almost 19-year career, he's always just been like the middle of the pack. I think he almost rose to the top in like 2009, 2010, but... He's never really had the success that he's had now. So again, for Ed, from this point on, I will no longer criticize Tank. I will let him do his thing. And if if he fails, then well, I guess I'll have to be like I told you so. (laughs) 
We will take see. That I, I well, that's pretty much how I live my life. You know this. So you know, he's got a new album coming out very soon. Apparently, it's gonna be more of a mix and not so heavily trapped as the last album. So maybe this will be a better way. And you can't hate on the success of when we it worked. I'm just like, okay, it worked once. Let me see it do it again. Show me that this was an anomaly. Show me that you <laughs> know what you're doing. And right now, I reviewed Sex, Love, and Pain too, and all those other. What was the um the other album? The Savage. album when we was on Savage. That's it. Yeah. Neither one of those albums were any good. So, all right, we'll see. Well, at last comment, uh, someone on the cipher wrote, "Sounds like Tank is mad about the sales of his last album, Stronger." And you wrote, "I'm mad because Stronger was whack." Well, Ed. did I lie? Ed, he was trying to be musical, man. He was trying to take it back to his roots. He was, and he failed. It was too boring. I mean, there were a lot of people in the cypher that were like, oh, I really like Strong. There were several people that were like, I like Strong. Cool. I didn't. I thought it was <laughs> way too sleepy. Especially from an artist. We always ride Tank. We talk about Tank all the time. We talk about Tank too much. But we know he can do better. Because he has given us great stuff. And he does great features. So he's just someone who just struggles to put an album together. I don't know why. He has done it before. In the past few years, you struggle. So we'll see. But I would say since one man, no, I can't remember when one man. One man is a little old. What was it? Whatever the album was before, is stronger. I think that was the last album I thought was okay. That's a long. That's almost a decade of slipping. Yeah, I think that was. Uh, this is how I feel. Yeah, yeah that was that the record? last one that was okay. Everything yeah. else, I don't know. <laughs> well, Ed, here are some projects that uh, are either coming out or are already out that you might dig. Uh, this new artist, Jay Howell, he has a single out on Urban AC. I know a lot of your fans on the Cypher were, were raving about his vocals, so check that out. Um, Sir yeah, has a new album out, and I know you've been meaning to listen to that for like a month now. But he has yeah, a record with Sabrina Claudio. He has a record out with Sabrina Claudio, and... And I even saw DJ Soulchild raving about it. I didn't even know Soulchild listened to new R&B. <laughs> Shout out to Soulchild. I could love that. Yeah, if Soulchild likes it, I'm kind of surprised. Sir isn't really his speed. So, And I've heard nothing but great things about this album. So, I didn't love his first one. I thought it was okay at best. So, I'll check it out and report back next week. And just so Soulchild doesn't get mad at us, uh, I'm going to give him a quick plug here. Uh, he has a Spotify playlist called R&B Isn't Dead, and I'm sure this song is on it, so go check that out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then one project that is coming out October 4th is Summer Walker. She's set to drop her new album. Ed, do you think Summer Walker can make an impact like an Ella May did? It doesn't seem like her singles have caught on as much as you know an Ella or a Her. No, and, and she's another one. She, there are a bunch of newer artists, Sir is one of them, that just get a ton of buzz and a ton of hype online in certain circles. But the music's just okay, and they don't really perform. I won't say they bomb, but they don't really break through like a boot up did. And people just keep really, really pushing the summer. It's like the next big thing. I've yet to hear a summer song that just was like, okay, this is the one. We talked about Normani before at some point on the podcast. That's another one. And I know she's more pop, but that's another artist that people just keep hyping up as the next big, big great thing. And it's based off of, I don't know if it's even Megan Thee Stallion. Like they're personalities that we love or people love. And they love them for like all these different things. But I'm like, tell me three songs. And people are like, oh, oh. If you can't tell me music this hot, that you just like the person, then you like the person. I mean, I like Kyle, but I'm not like Kyle is the best R&B artist ever. Because I can't name any Kyle songs. So, I don't know. I'm not feeling the summers and, the, and these, these joints. We'll see if this new project is good. There's a ton of hype coming, but I need to see some productivity behind all these hype tweets. Yep. 
Um, Ed, I like Megan because she's thick. Is that an acceptable answer? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Remember this time code so I can cut that part out. Good Lord. Jeez. Uh, speaking of Normani, and I know she does more poppy records, or at least her latest single is poppy. Ed, I feel like she just needs one big record that's not annoying and Ariana Grande sounding. And uh, I think we'd be fans. Like, real well, fans. Well, I... I agree, and the same thing goes with Summer. Like, I like the perception. I like the idea of a Summer. I like to watch Normani perform. I think she's talented, and they're good people. But at the end of the day, it's about music and not about if I like you. I know it's different. This is a different culture. We talked about different, you know, the way we consume music and media, and social media has changed everything. And really, we don't care about a person's, like, intelligence this sounds crazy but it's true we will overlook somebody's lack of intelligence if we like them like that's just what it is if you're entertaining in social media or you're entertaining in certain spots it doesn't matter how talented you are it's how entertaining you are do i like you people like these people but for me in my house i gotta like your music i can like your music and not like you and say okay you're talented but I need no money. I need Summer Walker. I need all of y'all to give me a, a song. Not a weird, sleepy sounding sample of some made up um, Say My Name, whatever that weird thing is Summer Walker has now that people like. That Say My Name remix is boring. Give me a hot song and then I'll get on board. Until then, I'm going to shrug my shoulders. <laughs> and can we, can we give Hitmaker, aka Youngberg, a shout out? I was going through YouTube yesterday and I, and I saw that he sampled. Uh, Can't Leave Him Alone by Sierra and 50 Cent. Ed, we really are getting old. That song came out in like 2005. <laughs> and to, and it's crazy because to me, that song doesn't feel that old. I mean, I, was, I wasn't married yet, but I, like, I knew the woman who would be my wife. And that song, I remember when that song came out, like the day it debuted. Now they're sampling it. And I'm like, that can't be right. Then you look at the date and see that it's old as crap. And we're old as crap. So, yes, we old. How yeah. odd we are our parents. Because our parents, when we would listen to songs from Puffy, and he would sample stuff from the 70s, and we would be like, this is great. And our parents would be like, oh, that ain't nothing but the stylistics. Oh, man, that ain't nothing but so-and-so. And then we're like, oh, whatever. This is better than whatever that old stuff is. Now <laughs> people are sampling Cameron and Sierra and Destiny's Child. And we're like, oh, that's just Shawnee's. That ain't... And they're like, oh, but Chris Brown is better. Oh, the way the world turns around. You millennials laughing at us old heads. Sooner or later, you will be us. I guess it wouldn't be millennials. It'd be Gen Z, whatever they are. The little that is kids. correct. Yeah. Ugh. It's, it's funny, Ed, because... I've been waiting for my era of music to, you know, make it psycho and become the nostalgia music. And I think we're finally creeping up to that. I heard Foolish on the radio, um, and it was like throwback hour. And Ed, I thought I would love it, and I thought, okay, now I can turn on the radio again and listen to my jams. Ed, it makes me feel insecure about my age. I'm just going to turn off the radio again. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it does. I will never forget the first time I heard Tamia while I was in the drugstore. And they were playing, it was like kind of the old folks station. And they were playing Throwback to Me. I think it was Stranger in My House. I'm like, what? That song came out when I was in college. I was just throwback. But yes, feel the age creeping on you. Your bones will crack like Captain Crunch. Oh, man. <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's go into the time machine right now because I know you ranked your favorite group, 112's discography. I know yes, you love them. Of course. And let's quickly go through this here. Um, at, and, and you can just give me a brief summary of each album and why you like it or why you don't like it. Or maybe both. Okay, let's do it. So at number six, which is, I guess, last, uh, would be the infamous Hot and Wet album, which we may sometimes actually reference on this podcast. I don't know why, but <laughs> it seems to be like the the reference point for a trash album. What did you like about this album, Ed? I didn't like much. Now, I will say this. This re- album has a reputation for being garbage. To say it's garbage is an old... It's, that's... It's not garbage. It's not. The problem is when you come off of three back to back to back 
incredible albums like 112 has to this, it is a huge step down. It has its moments. There are a couple of decent um, slow songs on it that I kind of like. Some classic 112 bedroom joints that I do enjoy. But as you can go, if you go to soulandstereo.com and check it out, you will see that there was lots of label issues between Bad Boy and Def Jam at the time. And that a lot of times is credited to like the sound being all over the place. Most 112 albums up until this were pretty cohesive. But this has got, it's got like the reggae joint and then it's got the club joint and then it's got the upbeat joint and it's got the chipmunk Kanye West soul sample joint and then it's got the 112 ballad and it's everywhere. There are some good songs, but boy, you got to pick and choose. Well, Ed, how about, you know, along with your M. Bison Fantasia hat, I give you a white tank top from the 112 hot and wet era. To, to, I don't want uh, that old soggy your... <laughs> tank top. That oh, greasy man. album cover. Who thought that was a good idea? And those are my, shout out my boys. Those are my boys, but uh-uh. The whole album cover looks like it was covered in chicken grease. Mm-hmm. Well, a little more classy uh, of an album cover was their latest album, Q Mike Slim Duran. This came in at number five. And we've talked about this project before. I think we all thought it was okay. But yeah, uh, was- I don't I don't think you can really expect much from that much time away from, from each other. Exactly. You got to remember, this was like, I mean, they were gone for well over a decade at this point. So to come back, I thought it was a cool sort of nostalgia run and the good thing about this album is it isn't just straight nostalgia they have some classic 112 sounding joints but then they have some when they try to update their sound it's not bad it's better than hot and wet it's not the biggest sin is really it's just not that memorable but it's got a couple joints on it for sure yeah and then we have pleasure and pain 2005 this was a solid album ed yeah, and this album is one that I remember. As I do these, people ask how I rank these albums. I don't go by memory because that would be unfair because, you know, nostalgia will screw you up. So I even though all these albums on this list, with the exception of the, the last two we mentioned, I've kind of listened to pretty regularly. I hadn't listened to Pleasure and Pain in a long time. So I went back, and this was a lot better than I remember it in my head. It was too long, but really solid it's the first album after 112's sticky and greasy or whatever it was called that was the first album that sounded like a true 112 album again so i was very happy about that it's got some really good underrated tracks on it just a little too long if they could have trimmed it up i probably would have raised it by a half star but pretty good and then at number three, you have part three, which interestingly enough, on the website, you have it as 4.5 stars. But on this podcast, you've gone on record multiple so- times to say it's a five star album. What's going yep. on here, Ed? Because remember what I just said, a lot of these albums, when I was talking about, when I went back and re-listened to these things, I had to give it fresh ears. So I had to review. It's not like I've ever reviewed part three before because Soul and Stereo been around a long time, but it went around in 2001. So this is my first time to actually go back and listen. And basically these album rankings are like mini reviews. So I had the chance to revisit and give it fresh, unbiased ears. And giving it fresh, unbiased ears, even though in my brain this was a five-star album, eh, it was close but no cigar. Like the previous album we talked about, it's a little too long. There was some stuff near the end that was kind of suspect and didn't kind of hold up as well as I thought it did. But overall, if this came out today, we'd be losing our minds. Incredible album. So it's not quite as flawless as I remember, but still worthy of their hallowed reputation for sure. Can we confirm that the point, uh, point five that was knocked off their, their perfect score was because of Peaches and Cream and Dance With Me? Those songs did not age well, Ed. I, do, I play it. I never, and I know a lot of people would be heated about this. But I never liked Peaches and Cream. I thought it was cornball from day one. Dance With Me, I still kind of like, even though it's not that great. I can enjoy Dance With Me, okay? It sounds very dated. But Peaches and Cream, no. Get out of here. And my theory is that you also knocked this album a couple of points. Decimals, really. Because Do What I Gotta Do was written by R. Kelly and you've muted him. 
Is this true? <laughs> that is not true. Although I have pretty much muted them. But no, that's not true. I love Do What You Gotta Do. It's kind of a mean song, but it's kind of like, yep. hey, I'm cheating on you, but bye. <laughs> oh, R. Kelly. Yep. I was just listening to Busted the other day by Mr. Oh, Biggs. Oh, no. <laughs> Mr. Biggs. Oh, what a time that was. You know, Ed, when I listened to that song now, I, did, I didn't realize how stupid the lyrics were. But Oh, I could have told you in 2003 <laughs> it was stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, especially, you know, Mr. Biggs was like 70. Why are you talking like this? Oh, man. And there was that one part. It was like, uh, you said you were going dancing. Now you're saying you're going shopping. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Ed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, come on. Oh, my God. Oh, music was fun for a little while. It was. Uh, number two, we have the self-titled debut 112, which Ed, I might mm-hmm. argue as that being my number one. But you have it as number two, and then, of course, you have Room 112 as number one. They're both five-star albums. What was the rationale there? Yes, and this was the one ranking. A lot of times, these rankings get folks in their feelings, and they're always, like, it always, that's why I like them. It causes conversation. And the biggest conversation that a lot of people were saying was, is 112 better than Room 112? I love both albums. Both get five stars from me. The reason why I went with Room 112 first is just because it's a more diverse listen. When it comes to quality of songs, it's pretty equal. Like it's, And I wasn't going to be like, both are number one. Cause that's, that's cheating. But I like that Room 112 has peaks and valleys. It's got the upbeat joints. It's got the, the little joints with um, Mace and Lil' Kim and all them on it. It slows down. You've got your letter. It goes mid tempo. It's got the sexy bedroom songs. It really is like everything that 112 has. If they open up the 112 toolbox, you get to see all of the different tools that they can build great songs. The debut is just ballad, 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 with like one or two mid tempos in there, and then of course the remix to um, "Only You." It's a really one kind of radio joint. Don't get me wrong, because those ballads are incredible. Some of the best of their era. That's why I gave it five stars. No, sh- no, no shade to 112 for that. But I just gave the second album the heads up because it's a little bit of a more diverse listen. Any day of the week, I could be like, oh, I prefer one to the other. But I just ranked it here because they just showed a little bit more versatility over super ballad heavy debut. Can't hate on you. Right. Now, Ed, what song is better? I Will Be There off the debut or Crazy Over You off the second album? I can't decide here. Mm, I might have to go with Crazy Over You. Like, just just my gut says Crazy Over You. Again, I can't hate on it either. If both of those came out today, they would be song of the year for 2019. But, no, might go with Crazy Over You. Oh, that song is incredible. All right, all right. So, Ed, are you ready for the Soul Back track of the day? I'm ready. Well, I don't know. Knowing you, it might be something shady. So, let's see. Uh, so, we're going to go with the record Day and Night by Isis. Which, Ed, if you look at now, that name, that is not an appropriate name in 2019. Isis? <laughs> oh, my God. I never that's put a, that together. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Player 2002 was a different time. I don't know if we've discussed this here, but I loved Isis. I thought that they were going to be the heir apparent to Destiny's Child. I love Day and Night. What was the other song that they had? Um, the one that can Single for the rest of my life. Yes. Yeah. They had like three or four songs that I really liked. I thought their debut was, I didn't think it was the best thing ever, but it was solid. Easily they could have been where when Destiny's Child started going pop and doing their other stuff and... We saw 3LW rise up a little bit. I thought ISIS would be right there with them. And I was kind of disappointed they imploded. But man, I love that song. And my favorite thing about ISIS, if you listen to Jada Kiss's rap on that song, he does not know how to pronounce that group's name. He keeps calling <laughs> them Icy. <laughs> yep, I was going to bring that up. Uh, maybe we no, They didn't ISIS. make him go... <laughs> Didn't somebody say, um, dude, can you re-record this and say our name right? They just thought, oh, just let it go. He's just calling them Icy. I'll tell you what, Ed, we're going to bring in a member of ISIS on, on this podcast so we can figure this out. <laughs> P- 
play. If we, if we say we're going to bring on the member of ISIS on this podcast, um, the government might be finally paying attention to Soulback, so we might be in trouble. We might have to spell it incorrectly. I mean, if Jadakiss can say it incorrectly, <laughs> I'm sure we can spell it incorrectly. <laughs> oh my god, yes. Oh man. Uh, are, we ready, are we ready for the Play of Please Awards, Ed? Oh, always ready. Even though I see it might be the Play of Please Award of the Week. All right, so if you remember a couple of months ago, um, R. Kelly was in jail and he needed to, uh, you know, he had, he had to pay money to, 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 to pay for his bond. And um, a lady, a random lady, paid like $100,000 to set him free. Oh, I remember. You remember this, right? Oh, yes. Well, recent reports uh, have stated that that lady is asking for her 100 k back because she was not aware of all of these allegations. She thought it was just one. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. She thought he just slept with one kid. He didn't know that she slept with, she didn't know that he slept with like 40. So it would be okay if it was one person he peed on. But when he peed on an army of girls, oh, now we have a problem. Why are people stupid? Please tell me this. Why are people dumb? I mean, I want my 100k back too. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be Ooh. mad at that. <laughs> How about you invest your 100 k in Popeye so they can bring back the chicken sandwich? Because that's probably about all the bread that they need to make for this mysterious sandwich. Instead of giving it to R. Kelly, when she... Oh, oh my God. See, now I'm heated. You just <laughs> said... It's one thing to say, okay, I didn't know. Well, first off, you said that, you're still stupid. But to say I thought it was not that bad means that you were aware that it was bad. But you still did it. Why are people insane? I mean, it was already insane that she donated a hundred thousand to someone she barely even knew. But you know, I, look, I don't know. I love, <laughs> I love Keith. I love him, but I'm not giving him a hundred thousand. Like I will go to your concert. I will buy your album, even if it has any mini mighty mo on it. But I'm not giving you a hundred k to get you out of jail. If you in jail, you. I hope you can sing good in jail, like um six nine, because that's the only time I'll be getting your albums. I'm not paying for these dudes got out of jail. What are you talking about? <laughs> yep. Uh, second player, please. And you mentioned him six nine. Ed, isn't he like on trial right now and he's snitching everyone out? Oh, he's. The, here's the funny thing about the six nine snitch. Well, I could spend a whole podcast on this moron. First of all, for those who don't know what this thing is, picture. A troll doll. Those little troll dolls with the little jewels in their belly. Now braid his hair up, paint six nine the the letters six and nine all over his face and hands and stomach and neck, in magic marker sharpie, and there you go. That's exactly what he looks like. So this dude joins the Bloods. First of all, if you what self respecting blood, but let this thing go in. He looks like a walking snitch. He looks like <laughs> so he looked like a police officer that put on a costume to infiltrate your gang. So he goes into the gang, he gets kidnapped, they rob him, they extort him, they just beat the crap out of him. So now he's on trial and now he's snitching. But the hilarious thing about the snitching to me is he's snitching on stuff y'all already know. He's like Jim Jones the rapper is a blood. Um he says that in every other song. Cardi B is a blood. Cardi B said she was a blood in a song. Like, why are we like, <gasps> she said he's snitching. I mean, you gonna say Lil Wayne is a blood? He says that too. Like, what? I mean, don't get me wrong. Dude's dead as a doornail when he gets off trial because he's snitching on real thugs. But everybody getting hyped up because he pointed out rappers are ridiculous when the rappers snitch on themselves. I don't understand life, Kyle. What is going on? Well, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think there's a place for him in hip-hop once he uh, comes out whenever that is. I think he might be they sh gone the moment he steps out. There shouldn't have been a place anyway. Why did we let this man in, in hip-hop? Why is he here? <laughs> this is true. I've been saying this for years. He has one song that people like, and it's and I don't even, I'm not even going to name the song he has because I don't want to give him any streams, but it is horrible. You can look at him and tell he's terrible. He looks like trash. He looks like something that just crawled out of your garbage disposal. 
But apparently, he's a good rapper because he's funny. And this is where we in now. So he can laugh himself into witness protection. And I don't know how witness protection is going to look. When you have the number 6ix9ine tatted on every exposed part of your skin. They're going to have to just bleach his skin. Like, what are they going to do? Yeah. He'll probably... Yeah, I don't... He probably just... Yeah, I don't know, Ed. <laughs> I don't know. But one thing I do know is that uh, Tank is getting a play of please. Uh-oh. How'd your boy get a play of please? You just talked to him. I thought y'all were buddies. We are cool, but he apparently is not cool with some people on Instagram. He, uh... He really wanted to show and prove that he belongs in this industry and he has the accolades. So he sent out a tweet and on Instagram wrote, To all the media and press, please refer to me as Grammy Award winning artist Tank. Not Grammy Award nominated because I've won a Grammy before. And that led to a lot of people saying, what did you win? And it was a honest (laughs) and genuine question. And, of course, you have the tank stands who don't really do their research. They just want to back their boy up. They're like, uh, you should know what he won. Don't be dumb. And at that point, still, nobody had any idea what was going on. Until Tank made another post, screenshotted Jennifer Hudson's debut album, and said, I produced one song on here. Hence, and, and it won a Grammy, so hence, I am a Grammy Award winner. Where, and then someone commented on that post and wrote, You're not a Grammy Award winner. Jennifer Hudson is. You don't get anything from this. So, after all of that, Ed, I did some Wikipedia research. I looked at the Grammy guidelines. And what it says is, if an album wins album of the year in one of the genres, so in this case, the R&B album of the year, which, Ed, I cannot believe that album won, but, you know. Yeah, that's another, that's a whole other thing, player. <laughs> I, I don't know how that happened, but... Uh, apparently, you have to produce 51% of the project in order to qualify for a Grammy Award. Tank did one song on the project. So, if we're going by that definition, Tank is not a Grammy Award winner. But the issue with this play of please, or, or why we're giving Tank the play of please, is as he was defending himself and calling himself a Grammy Award winner, he was out here calling stands mentally ill and saying that they were crazy and they they had no lives but in the end he was wrong so let's see who is crazy and has no lives player if you say i'm a grammy award winner and you're clearly lying as kyle has proved i would do this if i was like i'm a grammy award winner and people would say no you're not you know what i would do I would go because everybody lives and breathes on Instagram. I would get a I would get the physical Grammy that I have because if you're a Grammy award winner, you have a statue because there's a million of them statues running around. You get a statue, you take a picture and you say, "Here's my Grammy." If you are talking about you're a Grammy award winner and you ain't got no little record player with the horn on it sitting on top of the thing, your little mini Victrola statue, you is a lie. Tank is a lie player, and you just kind of proved it. So your boy is out here. Why? Why? Why do we keep defending Tank? Why do we keep defending Tank on this podcast? Somebody tell me why? Because every week it's some mess with this guy. Why? Like you gain nothing by lying. You don't have a Grammy. Where that? <laughs> well, Ed, this is what I want you to do because I know you didn't do it last time. I want you to tweet out. Your tank discography and and the ranking for it and tag him in it and you might be in a two day fight with him on Twitter just like Boom Boom Caesar was. Oh my goodness! Didn't somebody and I, I didn't tweet it out because I forgot to tweet it out and Tom was like, "Why didn't you tweet it out with the tag?" Someone took that and then sent it and tweeted. Dude, was it you? Someone did that. Someone that like something did. I would do. It sounds like something weird you would do, but someone did do that. Tank didn't bite. I might have to do it again because this dude loves to fight for no reason. And trust me, you don't want to spar with your boy when it comes to the verbal battles or the social media battles. So come on, Tank, if you want to do it. But I just cannot believe the gall that you would go around calling people mentally ill when you know full well that you're lying. You can't say that there's confusion 
Because you never got a Grammy statue. Nobody's running around here saying, I got a Grammy and don't have a statue to prove it. Oh my goodness. I'm heated again. And it's all because of Tank as usual. And maybe after this podcast, you'll catch your wife listening to One Wee again. No, yeah, and then I think it's to the point where, like, when she hears me comes in the house, she'll just, like, turn it off. <laughs> she has to sneak and listen to when we, because I despise it so much. There you go. So, Ed, I think that's it for this week's podcast. I do want to make a point here. Um, there is no special guest anymore. We've decided to remove it from the podcast just because we felt like you guys want to hear from us. That's what that's that's what it seems like at least so these episodes moving forward will just be me ed and tom uh talking for about an hour or a little less i don't know if we can go for an hour every week but um i think this will work out for everyone we'll still have our guest features but it'll just be on a separate post um on youtube or or however you're listening to it um so ed aside from that what's going on on your end well, just before we get into that, I do want to um, say something about that because people have already asked because there's been a little bit of talk online. It's like, man, y'all aren't doing the guests anymore. Not, there's nothing that happened or was like, oh, we have to stop doing guests. You know, people love to turn stuff into drama. There's nothing that happened or something that happened that we had to cut it back. We decided, well, like, hey, we got the guests. A lot of, for instance, we talked about Tank and a few other reviews. Those will be separately on, you know, I got Soul Sight, which is cool. There may be an opportunity to have some more guests on, but as far as a regular weekly feature, that probably won't be as much as prevalent as it has been in the past few months. But other than that, nothing's going to change. Same old content, same old rants and ravings from your three faves, and we're going to be here doing the thing. So keep supporting. We're going to keep bringing R&B, keeping R&B alive as only we can. But no, nothing bad happened. Nothing went down. We just wanted to have a change of direction. We just won't start doing trap. We ain't changing in that. We're not that desperate like some of these other folks. But anyway, check out soulandstereo.com this week. If you missed it, we kind of went through the 112 ranking. But if you want to kind of dive deeper into what I had to say about that, you can go check that out on the site. As well as a new edition of Love Letters featuring your boy, Kyle, Donnell Jones and his Where I Want to Be song, which is Darnell? the most horrible song. If you, Old Darnell, if you want advice from Darnell, don't listen to this song. But I know everybody loves it. So go check out the latest edition of Love Letters on the site. We got that rolling. And as Kyle mentioned earlier, stay tuned in the next couple weeks because we will be counting down the 100 top R&B songs of the past decade. That's coming very soon. Absolutely. And Ed, I just want to give a quick shout out here to Billboard Bear 209 on Instagram. That's our weekly shout out. He sent us a very nice DM saying how important this podcast was for the culture and that he tunes in every week and he loves what we're doing. And then at the end, he wrote, oh, also, I'm an artist, so check out my music. So I was like, mm, <laughs> I don't know if this is real love or if this is just a artist submission. But uh, he actually sent a follow up uh, message and said, no, I actually really love what you guys are doing. So keep it up. And there was no artist. No. So I, I love it. It's real love, but it's also you got to promote your stuff. I ain't mad at your brother. We all out here hustling. So do what you got to do. But yeah, shout out. We've had a lot of nice love come through recently. And I really like to. It's always cool. Even when we disagree and we go back and forth on social media or through email. It's always good to see that there are passionate fans out there appreciating what we're trying to do. We're just trying to bring it back. That's all. Yep. So, Ed, I think that's it for this week. I actually have a couple of interviews I have to do today. Um, we'll see what comes out of that. Because, guys, let me tell you, it's not easy booking these interviews. I'm going to put it out there. Artists and management, they kind of suck sometimes. You have some good ones, but then you have some that really suck. So, hopefully by the next podcast, we actually have some interviews to post for you on You Know I Got Soul. If not, you can at least know that I tried. Right, Ed? <laughs> I think that'll be next week. And then Kyle goes off about how raggedy some of these press people are for these artists uh, representatives. That's worth 30 minutes of ranting in itself. Yes, it so, is. Tune in next time to watch me throw more people under the bus. Yep, and maybe we'll have Tom to join us for that. Ed, I think that's yeah. it for this week. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get out of here before we get thrown out of here. But yes, all right, player. Always good to see you. Always good to chat with my boy, and we'll be back next week. Yep, yep.